Uh, is acting as a partnership representative a prohibited transaction? Uh, do you want to knock that? No, this is all you. No, this, I see. This is what I. This is <laughs> not push back. I'm going to throw this at you. <laughs> no, okay. So a partnership representative. There's there's rule new rules on the um, what used to be a tax matters partner, which meant somebody who was responsible to deal with the IRS in the event they were auditing a partnership. Because for those of you who pay great attention to, to partnership taxation. Partnerships don't pay tax. They pass the tax down to the owners. So if you have a partnership, which is two or more individuals or entities acting in concert for, you know, for a business purpose, um, if you meet that test, you have to file a 1065 every year, which is an informational return. And what this says is, hey, we now have one party and we're going to assess the tax at the partnership level. So this is kind of weird. Now, certain people can opt out, but I can just tell you none of our clients can because you're because you're entities. Uh, it, you'd have to be individually owned. And, you know, quite often you look at that and it has to be less than 100 people. And they could say, hey, we're going to opt out of this and still use a tax matters partner. Uh, all this this fancy way of saying is who the IRS deals with. Who's the party that they deal with? Now, this is why it's important. When I see prohibited transaction, I'm now thinking you're dealing with somebody who is investing through their IRA or 401k in a partnership. Right. And so let's say that you have two IRAs investing together in a transaction uh, or better yet, actually, the IRS uses an example of you have, you know, company one and, and company two and company two is an exempt organization is an IRA or an LLC owned by an IRA or a 401k, you can just fill in the blank. Um, that party doesn't pay tax on the receipt of the funds unless it's something called UBIT, but we're not going to worry about that. What they're saying is, hey, let's say that they're owners in a building. Um, the reason it comes up is because when the partnership's being audited, you could say, hey, you shouldn't hit us that hard because part of us is owned by an exempt organization. Now, the party that is a participant in that exempt organization, so now we've gone through th two different levels, okay? We have the partnership, we have the owner of the partnership, and now we have the participant in the owner of the par partnership when that participant is an IRA or 401k. So we've broken it down into pieces. They are a prohibited uh, or disqualified person as far as self-dealing with that uh, or entering into transactions with that exempt organization, the IRA or the 401k, with very few exceptions, are they a prohibited person from being a partnership representative? The answer is no, not as far as we can tell. There's nothing out there. In fact, if your IRA was audited, you're allowed to defend it. If your IRA is ripped off, you can you can start a lawsuit against the party who ripped you off and all those things. Like you're allowed to do administrative activities on behalf of your IRA. So you did really there. good on that one. All right, that was a breakdown into little pieces. Lots of questions have been coming in. Um, is a partnership income and an IRA required income tax be paid on that income? I'm gonna send you guys all to English school. Like I, this is the. I'm just like reading some of these questions. I'm just teasing on you guys, but some of these are really bad. Um, does the IRA, no, the, the income flows through to the IRA and keeps its character. If it is unrelated business income, then you possibly could if it's an act, you know, so if the IRA is getting active uh, income, it's an active partner, then you might have an issue. But if it just owns like an interest in a corporation, interest in a passive activity, then we don't ever have to worry about that. Yeah, so, so that, I mean, that IRA is going to get a K-1 from the partnership, but you just file it. There's yep. nothing else to deal with it. You are exempt for the most part. Um, and then somebody says real estate professional. We've gone over real estate professional in the past, but I'll just tell you again. And uh, like I think I already said it once before, but I'm just going to go through it again very quickly. There are two pieces of real estate professional status. You have to, A, uh, qualify as a real estate professional, which requires that you spend 750 hours and it is your number one use of your work time. So whichever one is greater, so you have to spend at least 750 hours 
and it has to be the greatest use of your business time. So if you spend 751 hours being a therapist, you can, you boom, you're, you, you, you lose, you're not a real estate professional. All right, if you meet that test, then you also have to be a material participant in your real estate activities. And that's a much lower test. That could be, you know, just a few hours up, to, but it's automatic if you spend over 500 hours. And it has, you have to aggregate all your activities into one. So our first question was about property aggregation. All right, that's about as much as I'm gonna say. That converts a passive activity into where you can actually write it off against your ordinary income. Now here's the, the big one. If you are filing a joint return with a spouse, only one spouse has to qualify and all activity is treated as one. Like so, they you, you, basically you could be, you know, some executive somewhere making a million bucks, and your spouse makes uh, or spends enough of their time, uh, his or her time on real estate, and they meet the test, and it offsets your income because you have a bunch of uh, um, losses. And material participation just means you're participating in any activity involving your property. It could be the managing, the manager, it could be looking for property, whatever, there's like a, a list. And uh, there's a bunch of videos that I've done on those, and you can look at some of the past Tax Tuesdays as well. Uh, now people are asking about opting out. If you don't opt out from the central audit regime, then are you required to pay tax at the partnership level? No, you, you, like this is what it is, is they can assess the unpaid tax. They audit the partnership. And the partnership is going to say the partnership now owes the tax. In other words, normally when they audited a partnership, they would just go and, and audit each of the partners. Now they don't have to do that anymore. They can just uh, they can just basically audit the partner. Yeah, the, these aren't all that different yeah. from the old TEFRA rules. It said, yep, you you got companies and all kinds of stuff. You got over a hundred partners. Mm -hmm. We're just going to tax the partnership, so you don't have to reissue K ones to everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. If you are a counselor consultant, do you need the same 758 hours? No leads you do not have to this is only for real estate and it's because real estate is is deemed to be a passive activity unless you meet this exception